Welcome to Bergonomics, demystifying economics with Ross McDowell. Welcome to the Bergonomics podcast, where today we will be demystifying why the retail price of your steak, mints and other beef cuts hasn't plummeted, reflecting the nearly halving of beef cattle prices over the last 15 months. Joining me today is Angus Gidley Baird, Ribobank's Senior Animal Proteins Analyst. Angus humbly describes his role as sifting through data, providing market information and insights back to Ribobank's clients to help them make informed business decisions about beef, sheep, meat, pork, poultry, and seafood, which are all the protein foods. Welcome, Angus. Thank you for joining me today. Not a problem, Ross. Good to be on this. I, we do our own podcast. It's nice to be on, on someone else's. <laughs> now, Angus, I've spoken to farmers, independent butchers, and well-known agriculture industry identities about why falling beef prices aren't flowing through to retail prices. My head is now exploding with the complexity of demystifying this topic. From April to the end of June, the price of beef fell 18%. Yet, over the same period, the Australian Bureau of Statistics Consumer Price Index said that only 2% of that decline had flowed through to retail. Now, beef 15 months ago, approximately, was 46% higher in price. In explaining why the full extent of beef's plummeting prices isn't being reflected in retail prices, I thought we'd take a walk down the beef supply chain because if we're going to demystify things, we need to put things in sim simplistic terms. And I thought we'd do that by starting off with the farmer who grows the beef. Tell me, I'm a beef farmer. What am I growing uh, in terms of being put on the shelves of butcher shops and supermarket chains? And how long is it taking me to grow it? Yeah, that's a good question. We probably need to clarify first up, Ross, um, they're cattle producers as opposed to beef producers. So uh, in terms of the separation in the market, the, uh, the producer or the farmer is, is growing and producing cattle. And then they go through the processing stage and land on the retail sh shelf as beef. So okay. um, that steak that you buy at the supermarket is one of many components that actually are taken out of the, the cattle production process. So it's a value-added um, chain. Yeah. It is. Yeah, very much so. Um, but it's also, uh, I think in terms of talking prices, you know, distinguishing between cattle prices and beef prices, because there are so many parts along that chain sure. and it's such an expansive sort of, well, yeah, a, a, as you say, a value added supply chain, but things come in and out as well. So it has an influence on it. Um, but yeah, as a cattle producer, um, generally there are Oh, you could probably say there are sort of three broad areas. There's the the breeding function mm -hmm. uh, that that run cows and they produce calves every year. Those calves are then grown out, and you might have a backgrounder um, that takes those calves from. What's a backgrounder? Uh, backgrounder is another producer, another farmer, but yep. he doesn't have breeding cows. He's buying calves at about 150, 250 kilos. He's growing them to. 300 and 350, 400 kilos. Um, and then there's a feedlot that sort of picks them up at 350 to 450 kilos and puts okay, them. Okay. Let, let's not lot. get to the feedlot yet. Let's just stick with the, let's, let's call him producer. <laughs> no, let's call it, let's call him our Angus beef grower, Angus, just to keep it in line with your name. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm completely comfortable calling them Angus breeds. We've got to recognize there are a lot of other breeds out there though. <laughs> well, well, yes. Yeah. Just go through for people in okay. terms of steers and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the types. Yeah. So the producer, the breeder is running uh, cows. Those cows are generally from a reproductive age point of view, you know, two years to 10 plus years. Each year they have a calf, sort of a similar gestation cycle to a you know, human. It's about a nine month process um, between when it's fertilized and then the calf is born, that calf 
probably then takes about eight months, depending on where you are. Northern Australia growing period is slower and different types of breeds, et cetera. Southern Australia, Victoria, et cetera, they'll more British breeds, they'll grow faster in bigger cattle. Generally, yeah, eight to nine months at age, they'll sell them as what we call wiener cattle. They're the 150 to 300 type weight kilo, uh, kilo weight cattle. And then they go on to the next stage. Now, a, a producer might have the country that allows them to breed and to fatten and finish cattle all in mm-hmm. one, but generally it's a slightly different type of country. So, Hang on. Fatten and finish. What does finish mean? Yeah, so finish is get it to the weight that it's ready for slaughter. So you're taking that, uh, the, the fattening part is the 200 kilo calf, taking them up to sort of 400 kilo, and then the finishing is sort of the 400 to five 600 where they're selling it. Okay, um, and we're doing this because the heavier cow, I'm going to get my terms wrong here, but the heavier the cow, the yeah. more money you're going to make. Yes, yeah. And then at the end of the day, we're eating muscle. Um, you want as much muscle on that animal as you can. And, and the idea from a producer point of view is to grow that muscle uh, as quickly as you can. So you need a frame, uh, the, the skeletal frame to, to put the muscle onto. So you need a big animal that's, be, uh, that's able to carry that muscle. And then you need the, the feed, whether it be in grass form or grain form, to, mm-hmm. to get that animal to turn that into muscle. Okay. Um, so you, want it, yeah, you want, it, want it to put on muscle as quickly as you can to get it to that weight. And again, slightly different markets to demand different things, but you're looking in around sort of that 400 to 600 kilo plus um, as and a what, finished animal. And what age are we talking about? I, we have to be generalized here rather than specific because I know we can, you know, farmers yeah. will get, get carried away with specifics, but, you know, what, what are we looking at generally? As an average, you could say about two years old. From birth to finish. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. And along the way, the farmer incurs a whole lot of costs, such as, well, there might be some feed, there's, you know, fuel to run his trucks. Certainly there's fertilizer to make the grass grow. Uh, yep. And he absorbs that cost as part of his profit making operation. That, and uh, he wants to try and maximize the difference, difference between those costs and his sale price of his cattle. Yes. Definitely. Okay. And, and yeah, I mean, Australian producers are pretty good at being very efficient. We've got some of the most efficient opera producers in the world. Um, a lot of the costs in our beef production system occur post farm gate. Okay. But yeah, we might move into that later. So we've just had our second birthday with our cow. What, what am I calling it? What? Call it a steer. Yeah. Okay, steer. Could, so we've it could just... be a grain fed or a grass fed steer. Okay, he's just blown the candles out on his second birthday and seen the truck rolling up to take him off to market. He is going to be sold at auction or he's going to be sold because someone else has bought him on a contract at some other stage. Is that right? Yeah, generally, generally. So there are a number of different ways. As a an, an owner of livestock, you can sell. You can sell direct to the buyer with a private treaty or you can run them through the auction process. We've got an online auction, uh, a couple of online auction platforms in Australia, um, or through a, a physical sale yard. But okay. generally, if you've got a finished animal, you'll be, you've got limited buyers. You know, the processes are the ones that are buying the finished cattle. There's no point in another producer bidding or, or, or going to an auction to buy a finished animal. And no, they can't put any value on it. So okay. um, they... The, the young stock tend to go through more of an auction process because there's a bit of a bidding war. There are multiple buyers looking for mm-hmm. those types of cattle. Mm-hmm. But when you get mm-hmm. to that finished end of the, the cattle production system, it's effectively the processor that's buying for it. And there are, you know, three or four key processes and, okay. and a number of smaller ones. Do you call the auction market the spot market? Uh, yeah, effectively. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, if you, were, if you were to sell cattle today, yep. um, you sell them at an auction, that's, yeah, the price you'd receive okay he's just had his second birthday he's gone off to auction he's been auctioned and the grower gets whatever is the market rate as determined by that auction yep so in economics we would call that he's a price taker not a price setter do you agree with that he's at the mercy of the market yes if they don't want to pay it they're not going to pay it no, although there are, I agree generally, but like what we've seen through 2020, 2021, 
Mm-hmm. And we had a very short supply of cattle. Mm-hmm. That producer in deciding to take it to auction is is having an ability to pick his price because there was very strong demand for the product and very mm-hmm. limited supply. So he's in sure. a much stronger position, whereas at the moment we've got weaker demand and stronger supply. Sure. So he's but a the, much more but price taken. The out. laws of supply and demand were working efficiently before and now in terms of yep. price setting. Yeah. Would you agree with yep. that? Okay. Yeah. I mean, and it's also worth noting that only roughly one third of the beef grown in Australia remains domestically. We export about two thirds roughly. So overseas yep. demand can play a role in that, can't it? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, in the sense that the, the processors buying those cattle will be supplying that export market. Yeah, it's upwards of 70, 75% that's exported. And is the overseas demand playing the main role in why that 46% price drop has occurred? No, the the major drop in cattle prices that we're seeing at the moment is a result of an increase in supply on the market. Mm -hmm. That's through the gradual rebuild of the herd and the inventory coming through. So if we we go back to 2019, it's a very dry year. People got rid of a whole lot of cattle. In 2020, they started rebuilding their herd. Um, so from 2020 onwards, the progeny we were producing has started to increase. And now in 2023, we're starting to see the result of that progeny come through the market. And so from here on, we're seeing increased volumes of cattle come onto the market because increasing inventory. We've yep. also got a bit of a situation at the moment where there are, you know, the Bureau of Meteorology is predicting or proposing that we might move to an El Nino stage. People are a bit concerned about dry conditions, so they might actually offload a few more cattle um, to prepare themselves for it. So it's mainly a supply thing. We are a little bit constrained in the processing capacity, but that's a, a labour challenge that we've got at the moment. We'll get to process it. Okay. Now, the figures that I've got from uh, ABS and a couple of other sources, our beef farm His revenue has declined 10.8% in the last 12 months. So collectively, Australian beef farms, their revenue fell to $21.7 billion in the last financial year. So they're not going as well. You'd expect them not to be going as well because they're not getting as much for their steers or cows. Now we move along. Next in the supply chain is the feedlot. Am I looking at that correctly yes. be- before we get to the processor, the feedlot? Yeah, so a feedlot is a, uh, a confined uh, feeding system. So the cattle are purchased generally sort of between 350, 450 kilos. So they're sort of uh, they're probably about an 18-month-old type animal. Uh, mm-hmm. And then they go on to feed for generally being used as a finishing type operation, sort of okay. 70 to 100 days on feed but we are starting to see more and more longer fed programs 150 200 days wagyus are on there for 300 days plus um, being fed a, a a very protein and energy rich diet to encourage growth okay and we're talking about uh, the inputs for a feed lot are grains grain yep yeah biggest costs are cattle and grain okay and grain fluctuating a lot but certainly skyrocketed due to the situation in the ukraine um and so they've suffered the figures that i have is that beef cattle feedlots revenue fell by 8.9 percent so their revenue revenue is down to 7.2 billion dollars in australia but they so you know plus or minus they're down about the same as the as the beef grower yeah, and the feedlots, unfortunately, are, are, are a part of the supply chain. And as we talked about that growth in cattle. So, you know, if you've got cattle that have been on feed for 100 days, you bought them 100 days ago when the market was higher, you're now selling them into a market that's lower because the market's been falling. So there's that challenge as well Yeah, since probably mid last year as the market's fallen. The feedlot, we're talking about a price setter or a price taker. Our farmer, he was a price taker. A feedlot, is he a price uh, setter? Oh, he's a, a bit of both, but you could probably say he's more a price taker in the sense that he will, one, he has to buy cattle to ensure that he's got volumes of cattle in the market. So in that sense, he's a bit of a price taker. He has to pay what he has to pay um, in terms of the availability, but he'll also be understanding or knowing what those cattle are going to sell for out the other end based on his offtake agreement. So he'll know what he's getting and therefore he'll enter the buying market with the knowledge of what he's getting. So... Yeah, he's a bit of both. 
But when now we get to the processor, is is a processor something that has aptly been renamed that was an abattoir? Yes. Yeah, yes. Some, depending on who you speak to in the industry, some countries or parts of the world call them slaughterhouses, some call them abattoirs, some call them processors. But yeah, it's, and, and effectively, I mean, why they're probably more commonly called processors here is that there's the abattoir function, which is the slaughter part, but then they're taking that, that carcass and processing it into a form that's potentially retail ready or export ready or into the byproduct channel. So, okay. Um, that's do they buy in their own too. right or do they uh, simply offer a service that they charge a fee for in terms of processing or do they do both? Do both. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Well, most of the big ones will do both. Some, they, they sort of, they, they can tend to sort of shift that a little bit. Um, uh, again, the timing of the, the whole process, you know, for example, in the last year or so when cattle prices are falling rather than them go into the bar market and buy cattle knowing it's going to process they've got to process them and then sell them out the other end in a falling market um it might be better for them to take a stronger position in terms of what we call toll processing for someone else you just mm-hmm. get paid a set fee to process the animal rather than actually taking ownership of an animal and then having to sell it in a market that's falling you know there are those considerations but generally most will be buying their own cattle and some will be processing for other operators on a, uh, other members of the supply chain as a, uh, a fee for service. Is right. that a pretty tricky situation the, the processes are in because they've got to balance what's coming in one end and going out the other end? Yes. So there's yeah. a high and, risk there? Yes. Uh, I suppose you could say that in the sense that, yeah, they've got to find a market and you're dealing with a perishable product too. You know, there's a finite life of this, this beef once it's, once it's been processed, it, you know, whether it's frozen or chilled, obviously frozen has a longer shelf life, but chilled product has a, a as a definite finite um, life, it might be 70, 90, hundred days, but the processor has to be able to get that into market and then on a retail shelf with enough space in that shelf life for that retailer to feel like they've got the ability to sell it too. So yeah, you, it is, it is a, uh, yeah, from that sense, it's a, it's a, it's a high risk. They're, they're buying cattle and they're selling them and they've got to be able to sell it into a market like we've got at the moment. We've got soft demand from mm. global markets and domestic markets. Mm-hmm. You know, the challenge for them is, is finding a home for that. Okay. Last Financial year, their revenue rose four point seven percent. Our farmers gone backwards ten point eight percent. Our feedlots gone back eight point nine percent. Yet our processor has gone up nearly five percent to twenty four point six billion dollars in revenue. He's bigger in terms of revenue than beef farmers, which is interesting. Now we get to the retailer which is what this podcast's all about. Food retail in Australia is worth $165 billion. Supermarkets account for 83% of beef sales. Independent butchers, 17, according to the Meat and Livestock Association. For a supermarket, the single biggest category item, other than probably alcohol, I'm not sure how cigarettes goes these days, is beef. If I'm a supermarket and someone comes in and buys a beef product, they are more than likely to walk out with a shopping basket that is more than two and a half times the value of the basket of some that doesn't have any beef in it. So it's pretty important to the supermarket chains. Now, in looking at a 46% drop in what farmers are getting paid, going through our feedlots and our processes, if we just look at what the Bureau of Stats have done, so let's have an imaginary beef product at $20 per kilo. And if we think about a 46% decline, that would equate to a drop in price. Decline would be a $9.20 decline. So therefore, if that was 100% pass through to retail price, that $20 beef product would be worth $10.80. But the Australian Bureau of Statistics has said that, in fact, that's not what's happening. That $20 beef product hasn't had $9.20 lopped off it. It's had 
40 cents. That's a 81% variance. $8.80 is the difference there. Now, that's pretty difficult to describe away through increased fuel costs, fertilizer costs, normal inflationary factors. Where do you think this massive variance is, is occurring? How is it being explained? Yeah, and this comes to the, uh, the the complexity of the Australian, well, it's not just beef, but it's the meat supply chain um, and the roles it plays. I know a number of people have tried to split it out in terms of the producer share and the retail share of the dollar um, of the product on the shelf and where the values are in that supply chain. We'll no doubt talk about some of the complexities of the, of the, the industry and they all get rolled up into managing a supply and and as you stated earlier the the supermarket has uh has this product on the shelf that it can leverage to be able to generate a big basket of goods so on one hand you can understand they're reluctant to push prices up as prices um maybe the cattle prices go up at the same time they're probably just as reluctant to drop the prices as quickly as cattle prices come down, trying to maintain a more consistent price for that consumer on a day-to-day basis. We don't have a huge seasonal variation in beef consumption. Um, There are probably cuts at different times of the year that have slightly different favours. Obviously, summer and barbecues, you probably buy more steak cuts and and sausages. In winter, you're possibly cooking, you know, more slow-cooked meals, so chuck steaks and things like that possibly have have greater demand. But generally, from what I know, we don't see Easter as a big period in the US for lamb consumption, uh, and then it drops off. Part of the, the explanation, I think, is that there's a degree of, it's not the supply chain, but I think there's a degree of Um, work being done by the retailers to try and minimize that price variance for that consumer so that they can go into a shop and know that the price of beef this week is is going to be similar to the price of beef in two weeks time there's not a lot of movement there's also management of the different cuts in the supply chain as we said earlier in the podcast you know a a beast or a, a steer is cut into so many different things most of which is meat but you know out of a whole carcass you possibly looking at, you know, 2% of that carcass is scotch yep. fillet. That might be $40 on the shelf, but yep. 22%, 25% is mince and it might be $14. So there's balancing that in the supply chain as well and all the other costs. Now, I, I can't comment because no one's done the numbers to know where the profit centers lie along that supply chain. At different times of the cycle, we will have, like we have in the last 12 months, we will have building volumes of cattle in the system, reduced producer demand that see cattle prices drop. In the 2020 to 2022 period, we had very short inventories and very strong producer demand that saw cattle prices go up. So the cattle market moves a lot. It's got a lot of different players in it. The meat market, um, I can understand, you know, trying to keep it consistent for that consumer to uh, have the confidence in in buying a product on a yeah, regular basis. But this is where I'm getting, wow, my, my mind is going, hang on. The, we've got the spot market and the contract market for beef. The supermarkets, as I understand it, are buying their animals when they're 18 months old. And so if I look at what's on the shelf now, that means that I'm looking at pricing from May and the price now is not 20% less, which is when they purchased it in May. May's price is not being reflected on what's on the shelf now, let alone the 48% drop. I then go to the next stage and I go, okay, so if if that's the price, then the consumer just has to put up with it. But the consumer doesn't have to put up with it because, because there is a spot market and there are independent butchers and those butchers currently do sell meat the same cuts, cheaper. I'll give you an example. So if I look at a, a large independent butcher in Melbourne, the same grade mints he's selling for eight fifty a kilo. The supermarket is $14. That's a, the supermarket's got a 64% higher margin. You mentioned Scotch fillet, $25 versus $32. That's 28% higher. So normally in economics, you'd go, oh, right, there's competition. The consumer is free to shop wherever they want to. 
and interest rates have gone through the roof. People's mortgages have skyrocketed. Everyone's screaming cost of living. You would think that people would be walking away in droves from maybe the supermarket chains to go to these independent butchers that are selling the same cuts, the same quality at far cheaper prices, yet they don't seem to be doing that. Why do you think that they're not voting with their feet? That's a good question, Ross. As a consumer, and this is only me as an individual consumer, you can understand the value of going into supermarket though. You go, well, okay, I'm going to, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? I don't know. Um, do you, have you decided? I, I would imagine there's a fair few people that hadn't actually decided before they walk into a supermarket. But you have the ability then to pick up the whole range of whatever you might need for that meal. Um, so there's a value associated with that. There's a convenience thing as well. We've unfortunately seen a lot of independent retail butchers drop out of the market. So uh, I know for me, going to uh, my nearest retail butcher, I've got to go past three supermarkets to get there. I can have my supermarket feed or food delivered to home as well. There are other values, I suppose, that that the supermarket is adding. I, At the end of the day, from a pricing point of view, they, I'm sure, are looking at it from a competitive point of view and, and tracking the rest of the market as well and, and understanding where they sit in terms of that price spectrum and, and what it might mean in terms of the movement of, of product on their shelves too. But you would have to say that if a $165 billion industry and it's the largest single category within that at retail, it is a very nice way to hide a good profit margin to help you your business and other areas increase its its profitability overall it's so big things get lost uh, yeah quite possibly i've never seen the break up to know where the different profit margins lie in terms of the different uh products on the shelves and whether one might be used as leverage or an incentive for the consumer or the other one used to uh, might have a smaller margin but it's being you know compensated by by another product in most products if the price goes up the consumer wanders off to look for a cheaper alternative in terms of the supplier or they go i'll find a substitute product and in this case they're staying shopping in the same location and going rather than having rump i'll have blade yeah, possibly. I I don't know. I'll, I'll challenge your rational economic thinking, although I believe that, I should, well, hope that consumers generally trend towards a rational sort of decision-making process. But you look at the uh, well, calculating per capita consumption based on, you know, production of beef in Australia, export of beef from Australia, what's left over divided by the total population. And even though we had those price increases in the last couple of years, retail price increases over the last couple of years, the per capita consumption by my calculation last year increased. So that consumer, and, and again, this is where it's sort of outside factors, like, you know, you could say, well, COVID prevented us from traveling. So we didn't have the ability to go on that fancy holiday and, mm. you know, spoil ourselves. So we've decided to stay at home and spoil ourselves. Maybe we've got a slightly, you know, greater availability of disposable income because we haven't spent it all on something else and we want to treat ourselves. So we'll go and buy that. And, and I, have, I have a real question in the industry at the moment is, well, you know, has that been enough to reset some of our consumer habits? Are we willing to say, I actually valued that product for what it was. I'm going to keep buying that product. The price for that is something that I'm, I'm more comfortable paying that price um it's a little bit like fuel isn't it you know we all don't like fuel prices going up but they do and we just readjust for it sure and i wonder if, if that consumer and this is where you know to, to the broader australian meat industry you've got to continue to be able to demonstrate that value to them but has that consumer sort of reset their expectations we we were very fortunate in australia for a long time having huge supplies of meat available given that we export large volumes and, and it's very, very cheap. Is the consumer just resetting their their expectations? And I don't know. These, these are questions that I, I don't have a, a data set that explains the answer to me, but I, they are questions I wonder in terms of that consumer spending habit. Okay. So when I talk to my friends that are farmers, grow beef, they believe this is unfair, the whole situation. They're price takers and retailers are price setters. And 
they've lost a lot of income, whereas the retailer doesn't seem to have lost any. What would you say to them? I can understand, definitely, but I'd, the retails or the supermarkets aren't, they aren't, aren't the price setter necessarily. As we mentioned before, 70% of our beef gets exported. Uh, for them to be able to buy the volumes that they need and the supply to supply consistent, so consistently, and well, we saw what happened in 2020 when meat disappeared off the shelves because they didn't have enough in the system and everyone bought a lot more. Um, but for them to actually have that on the shelf, they are competing against an export market as well. There's an export buyer out there, and if they drop their prices or, or they set their price expectations so low, the export market will pick that product up and then they'll, they won't have that on their, on their shelf. So I, I can understand when you look at it in a domestic market sense that they are the big players, but they, unlike some of our other industries like you know poultry, we hardly export anything pork, it's about 10%. We're talking sheep, meat and beef, 60 to 70% of our product goes overseas. So there's another buyer competing with that, that domestic retailer for that product as well. Now, again, we are in a softer period of global demand too. Um, the US has just come off a huge uh, liquidation of cattle. They've had large volumes of, of beef in the market. It's made it competitively uh, tough for us. We've had very strong livestock prices through the last couple of years that have meant that we had some of the dearest cattle in the world. So our ability to compete on that export market has been tougher. Now that the supply chain is, is quite full and that, does, that export demand is softer, and our volumes are increasing here, the ability to fit it into that market means that, yes, we probably don't have that same global competition that we've had before, which is possibly affording domestic buyer a bit of breathing space. But the cattle producers got to understand um, they're producing cattle. So they're in a cattle market. You know, they have buyers being retailers, uh, processors who sell into an export market, feedlots maybe, but they've also got buyers being other producers as well that are looking for those cattle. They've got a slightly different supply and demand makeup compared to the beef market. And that's why I noted at the start, we've got to talk cattle markets and we've got to talk beef markets. Now, right. they'll generally follow each other, but at different times, you will have pressures in those different areas that influence them more strongly than, than others. So at the moment, my belief is that our cattle prices are low because We've got an increased volume of cattle on the market. The producers aren't looking to buy and compete those cattle. So, And you can see the young cattle in particular, the replacement stock, the ones that the producers would usually buy, they've seen the bigger falls than the finished stock. It, they haven't dropped as much as the, the young replacement heifers and, and replacement cows, et cetera. Um, okay. so, so, that, so looking ahead then, you're yep. talking about the overseas market playing a big role in the Australian market. Looking ahead, They've had terrible droughts everywhere, Europe, United States. They've destocked, flooded the market with the cattle that they're destocking with, which means at some stage the rain's going to come and they're going to restock and they're going to bid up the price of cattle again, which yep. will affect our domestic price here. Yep. What time frame do you see happening for that? Uh, I think we'll see that that U.S., well, the U.S. has already started on their contractionary phase. They they reached their peak female slaughter at the beginning of this year. They now have far less cattle in the system. I think their cattle inventories are at 50, 52-year lows. Their beef production is going to gradually decline over the course of the next two years. As that declines, that U.S. market will seek more imported product. There will be less competition in our Japanese, South Korean and Chinese markets. So those people will be looking for the Australian product. That will pull Australian prices export prices up and that will mean that the domestic buyers in that market will have to compete with that stronger global market and that'll flow through to the cattle prices we've seen this before back in 2000 and the period between 2012 and 2014 um, in 2012 the u.s reached their last top of cycle in the sense that they had their mass uh, huge liquidation of female cattle but the period between 2012 to 2014 was their contraction. We saw in mid-2014, global meat prices jumped in the order of about, I think off the top of my head, 50 to 60% over the course of a couple of months. Australia, unfortunately, at that time was actually 
in the middle of a drought. So we were selling as many cattle as we'd ever done in history, or back to the 70s anyway. And even though we were selling those record numbers, so huge supply here, that global market sucked our cattle prices up 10%. So we are potentially running into a similar scenario now where that US shortage and the contraction they're going through is going to lead to much stronger global competition, which is going to mean you know, it's going to pull that through the system. Which is going to make the farmers smile in the next, what would you say, two years? Wait, two years? Uh, no, it's, I, I think I'm looking at about mid next year that we'll start to see that have that, that increase. Some strong influence, and, yeah. And so if we've seen not the full decline in beef prices reflected on the retail shelf, and then we're going to go through a period where overseas demand goes up considerably, pushing up domestic prices, we're going to say middle of next year, beef prices are going to start to go up, even though they haven't really gone down on the retail shelf. Yeah, I'm not going to second guess what happens between now and then from a retail point of view. But yes, uh, you look historically at retail prices, they don't tend to come down much. They go up in steps. They'll be pushed up, whether it's a shortage in supply or a strong global market and the prices get pushed up they probably hover there for a while and then the next cycle happens and they go get pushed up again yeah there's there's not there's not the same amount of volatility on the retail price side as there is on the producer cattle well, price because side. it's a commodity working on the spot market yeah now angus we get to the interesting part of the podcast okay now, you are the luckiest guy this. in the world <laughs> because we're talking about beef and now I'm going to give you the hamburger test. Think about the other people that have had to talk about the hamburger test that are in the auction business or the net zero business. You are in the ag business and hamburgers are nothing but agricultural. So in terms of looking at the decline in beef prices that haven't been passed through to the retail shelf as we would like to, what effect does that have on our simple hamburger? Good luck, Angus. <laughs> oh, it, in one way, it sounds so easy, but on the other hand, my ma- mind starts to race in terms of how I could turn this into a conversation, knowing that the hamburger chain that probably comes to mind every time we think about one is, is one of the biggest buyers of beef in the world. And they will be doing exactly the same thing that we've just had the conversation around in terms of managing the supply in the system to ensure that they can produce that patty and put it on that plate and charge seven seventy five or whatever it is for a Big Mac every day of the year. Um, and they wouldn't move those prices very often at all. So they're balancing that whole supply chain just as we've looked at it. And whether or not they have the ability to leverage on lettuce prices or cheese prices or bun prices um, to offset some of that, but um, managing that consistency, or sorry, managing that pricing consistency and the product and the quality consistency for that matter as well is is one of the, the key things that is part of their reputation. So yeah, they're in the middle of this, like the conversation we've just had. I think uh, trying to put it into that hamburger analogy, I think the beef that you buy in a, hamburger, in a hamburger is just the final product in a, it's not a long supply chain, but it's a very complex supply chain managing a whole lot of different factors that are all interrelated, but also have their own influence and in, at different points in the market. And um, yeah, a, a US burger that probably draws Australian product will be influenced by not only US supply of beef, but the Australian seasonal conditions and demand and volume of Australian cattle. So they're looking to try and manage that process as best they can, noting that seasonal volatility at the producer end causes a, yeah, a lot more volatility than what they want to actually pass through to the consumer. One part of me likes to think that as a consumer, we should really appreciate some of the challenges that producers face and, and be paying the, the price that they're receiving at that point in time. But the other part also says it's nice to be able to go to a, a, a hamburger chain in Sydney, knowing that it's the same product and the same price, I say every day of the year. I know you haven't mentioned it, but it is McDonald's. They're the largest buyer of beef in what circumstances? Uh, don't quote me on this live podcast, Russ, but I believe if they're not the biggest, they are one of the biggest buyers. Yep. In Australia, talking about or 
No, global beef supply chain. They are one of the biggest buyers. They're one of the biggest users of beef in the world. Because they're global, I guess, they dwarf yep. supermarkets because supermarket chains are geographically localised, aren't they? Whereas McDonald's are yep. everywhere globally. Okay. Yep. Angus, thank you. I hope we've demystified why <laughs> the prices haven't come through to the retail shelf. I'm sure that we're going to leave some people still thinking there's a conspiracy theory out there and uh, there is darkness afoot in terms of what goes on with the beef supply chain. But you've certainly enlightened us to the complexities and the array of factors that most people don't realise happen with that. So thank you. I appreciate your time and you have been an excellent expert. Thanks, Ross. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if we've necessarily made it clear either, but um, it is one of those supply chains that, I, yeah, I did economics, but you look at it and sometimes you do ask the question, but I think we've also got enough players all the way up and down that supply chain that mean if one of them is making any absurd amount of additional profit in the, in the market, and we've got to remember, we've got to look at this over a period of time. It's not on a day-to-day basis, but over a period of time because you don't just go and buy a meat processor or you don't just go and buy a cattle-producing farm and you know run it for five months. Um, it's a longer period, but I'm sure if, if, there were any, if there were any parts of that market that were out of whack, we would see movement into that space and people would pick that up in terms of the competition. That, maybe that's just me as an economist saying that I think competition would sort it out. Well, you would think competition would sort it out, wouldn't you? You would think that people would be voting with their feet, but they're not so much. They're staying wherever they're currently buying their their beef. But you would think that the competition amongst the different levels of the supply chain would create, you know, an equalisation of pricing at least along the way. And it and it probably does. It probably does. Mm. Thank you for your time. Not a problem, Ross. Good to speak. My thanks to Rabobank's Senior Animal Proteins Analyst, Angus gidley Baird for being today's expert. Also providing input for today's Bergonomics podcast were some of the doyens of Australia's beef industry, Tim Roberts-Thompson, one of Australia's largest Angus beef producers, and Peter Homan, the National Livestock Manager for Elders. Thanks also to Steve Allen, proprietor of Scotty's Meats, a large independent meat retailer located on the Hume Highway at Craggyburn in Victoria. As usual, Ology Creative provided excellent design assets supporting this Bergonomics podcast. Out next week, my personal 90-second summary perspective on the massive disparity between beef prices the farmer is paid and what you, the consumer, pays. Are there any economic dark forces at work in the beef supply chain?